this is the target establishment for suspect view for our victims. And remember, if there's a hazard or dangerous situation, move yourself to a position of comfort. We're running people over to the police. We saw about 1,200 little kids and found out that they were in fact trafficked and they were in fact slaves. These little kids are on this boat. They are not fed. They are abused beyond imagination. We got to you up. This is the girl. Whenever something like this comes, I imagine in my mind that girl is found. We have operations all over the world, rescuing people from slavery. Because today there are criminals who abuse children, sell girls. How old is she? 12. 12? How much? much? 30? Yeah, yeah, I'm at three. And force families into slavery. Criminals prey on the easiest target, the world's poor, because they expect no one to defend them. Pareho po tayong mga tao, hindi po tayo ibagay or hayo na pwedeng gamitin lang sa pansarili. But today, there are thousands of people gathering to seek justice for those in slavery. We are a group of lawyers, counselors, activists, and supporters. We are called International Justice Mission. And together, we form the largest international anti-slavery organization in the world. But slavery won't come to an end until criminals know they can't get away with it. So we partner with local police to arrest and prosecute criminals. This sends a message to slave owners. We will not go away. We stay with the survivors until they are healed, until they are free. Natulungan po ako ng IJM sa pamamigitan po na sa case ko, sa pagtulong po nila na ma-overcome ko po yung, yung fear. Each year, we rescue thousands of slaves and protect millions around the world. We are transforming how justice systems protect their citizens. To those who are still enslaved. We promise to find you. We will get you home to your families so you can have the freedom you deserve. Welcome. This is what we are calling Freedom Sunday here at Village Church, and I am so excited about what we are going to talk about for the next little bit. We are going to be challenged biblically about what finding justice in the world looks like for the church and our role in that. We're also going to be encouraged by stories from what God is actually doing out in the world through Village Church and our partners all over the place. So, Sit in with me here. This is going to be a fun couple, couple minutes as we, as we walk through this. But I want to point you first to a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 21, 15. Let's turn there. This is going to frame everything we talk about today. Uh, my name also is Jeremy, by the way. I'm a pastor here at Village Church. I oversee all of our ministry areas and staff team. Uh, and I'm just so excited about some of the guests I'm going to bring out here in a minute. But first, let's get a biblical basis for all of this. Uh, Proverbs 21 15 says this. It says, when justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but terror, terror to evildoers. When justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. And there are a few things I want us to take out of this passage before we hear some stories this morning, and they are this. First, when justice is done, did you know 
that justice is inevitable. The justice of God in the world will happen. It will come to pass. And maybe that is something you just need to hear today yourself. Maybe that's all you needed this week, that's all you needed today, was to hear this truth that, you see, God, we learn in the Bible, God is good and God is all-powerful. So that means whatever he wills and whatever he wills is good will come to pass. There's nothing that can stand in God's way. So whether you're someone who yourself has endured injustice, oppression, you've been treated poorly, abuse, whatever that is, you can rest in the fact that even if it seems impossible, even if it seems like it's never going to happen, justice will be done because nothing can stop God's justice. It's who he is. And so we will experience that in the end. But second, we, we understand from this little passage that God's justice is also incredibly powerful. It's powerful if you think about it in this way. You see, there are two response words used in this passage. Joy and terror. You see, God's justice, biblical justice, is actually not just about helping someone out. It's not just about freeing someone from a bad situation. It's not just about releasing someone from bondage. It's about more than that. It's not just about what brings us joy in someone being free. It's also about what brings terror to those who oppress people. See, God's justice, real biblical justice, is actually not just about the good of, of setting someone free. It's about what happens to the perpetrators, holding people to account, judgment, and not even just that, the rehabilitation of people who have been harmed. It also includes the systems around us, the world around us changing so that injustices don't happen in the world. That's the picture of holistic biblical justice. And that actually is what God is all about. That's his, his being, is things being right. And that is the kingdom that he's asked us as the church to bring into the world by his power. That's our calling. Our calling as the church is to create a world through him, of course, and through the working of his spirit through us, but through our humility and our service and our own actions to create a world that is just in all ways. So yes, it's great to, to help people and it's great to rescue a person and provide a need. That's a huge part of it, but it's a part of it. We as the church have to also be dedicated to changing this world into a place that resembles the very nature of God and his justice itself. And that is the kingdom of God here on earth. And then finally, third, you notice in this passage, there are two different camps when it comes to justice. Those who are joyed at it and those who are terrorized by it. There's the righteous and there are the evildoers. And this might seem like a, uh, an, obvious, an obvious question, right? Like who in this room, who listening to this online, who at any one of our sites would, would probably question feeling joy themselves at hearing about justice being done? Of course, we would all say, yes, I'm joyed by that, of course. So let's push this application a little deeper. Let's, let's just make it a little harder for ourselves this morning. Uh, today. How about when it costs you something? What then? What is our heart when justice being done has a cost for you or a cost for me or a cost for us as the church? How about then? Do we still feel the same level of joy at justice being done in the world? Or does that actually frighten us a little bit? And that speaks to our heart. And we want God to develop a heart in us where, no, we're, we're, we find joy in any justice being done, no matter what the personal cost to us. That's the heart of God. Think about the gospel. That's the whole story. It cost Christ everything. It cost him his life to bring ultimate justice into the world for you and for me. But also, we're going to speak to uh, the CEO of IJM this morning, IJM Canada. And, you know, International Justice Mission themselves one of our, our great partners doing incredible work in the world of bringing justice to people. Um, it costs them a lot. There are people working for IJM who, who have been murdered 
out in the field because of their work. It costs Christ everything. It costs the people we, we partner with everything to do this work. So of course, as the church, it's going to cost us. There's going to be a cost to this, and we have to be prepared to have the heart of God in us to say whatever the cost, we're willing to bring his kingdom into the world. And, and really, there is no greater witness. What greater witness do we have as the church than doing this kind of work? And I want to encourage you in something really specifically, that this work is no different than the rest of the kind of work that we're called to as the church. We can sometimes think, you know, well, evangelism or putting on church services or these other different things that we do as the church, that's one level of thing. And this kind of social work is another tier somehow below that. It's just not biblically true. The church is called to partner with God in bringing his kingdom into the world, and that kingdom is ultimately a perfectly just kingdom. And so as much as any other call we have as the church, it's this. It's to bring the justice of God into the world around us holistically. So with that in mind, I want to bring out our first guest. Um, she is an amazing woman who's a part of our staff team. Her name is Caitlin Weinberger. Let's give her a hand. She's the director of our Global Impact and City Impact. Caitlin, come on out. How are you doing this morning, Caitlin? So I brought Caitlin out because we want to get a, a little glimpse into what it is we are doing as Village Church, what global impact even looks like um, as Village Church. So Caitlin, a couple questions for you. First, why don't you give us an idea of what the main focus is of uh, the global work we do? Because of course, we could be involved in a myriad of things. There are no shortage of things we could be doing in the world. Uh, so how do we narrow that down to what we're focused on most importantly here? Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. And hello, everyone. It's so great to be here with you today to share an update of what we're doing globally. I always love when I have the opportunity to share about it. And as Jeremy said, we do have a few key areas that we've strategically focused on. The first one is combating human trafficking. And over the years, we've particularly focused on sex trafficking work. So the prevention, rescues, and aftercare side of sex trafficking. And then church planting. Village Church prioritiz prioritizes this across Canada, hopefully in other countries as well. And so we want to support national church planting movements that are happening around the globe that are raising up local pastors and leaders and doing discipleship training and Bible translation. So we do that in a couple countries. And then we also focus on... Um, Refugee care, supporting refugees who have been displaced from their homes or internally displaced in the country of their origin. And so providing education, medical care, or going and serving in refugee camps. And then we also support education with a focus on the most vulnerable people. And so people that are the least likely to attend school. Um, and with education, a lot of people say, why don't you guys focus on um, water or um, lifting people out of poverty. Well, education really is that key to lift people out of poverty. And with all the schools that we support, they provide wa clean water for their communities. Healthcare is taught through the schools and whole communities benefit from what education is doing for a child. Um, so those are areas we wanna be able to focus on just a few keys so that we can partner with organizations and really make an impact in those four key areas. And so we are excited to continue growing partnerships in those, but those are what we're gonna focus on. Amazing, I love how um, Caitlin's work in leading us in this is so strategic and well thought through. Uh, it's not haphazard. This is very, very, um, very well thought through and professional on how we're going to make the biggest impact we can in the most important areas of focus uh, as a church. So with that in mind, give us an idea of some of the organizations uh, and partners we have uh, that we work with. Yeah, we couldn't do this work without our partners. We have eight incredible organizations that we have built relationships with over the years. So we have organizations like Ally Global Foundation and International Justice Mission who focus on combating human trafficking. And then we have organizations like Kuwasha, Impact Ministries, and Global Shore that focus on education. And then we support Love Does, and they focus on refugee care, education and medical care um, for refugees. And then we also partner with Empower Ministries and Dusty Sandals that do church planting and Bible translation work. And you can find out more about all of our partners on our website. Yeah, and what I love about how you find partners for us is uh, by really getting to understand their work on a deep level. 
so that we're making really, really strategic and important partnerships that are extremely well thought through so that we understand, hey, is this an organization that uh, you know, is even using money well, using resources well, actually seeing an impact and a difference, doing the right things, uh, all those become factors and it's, it's not kind of just random how you do it, I love that. It's, it's very strategic and it's very intentional about who we're gonna partner with because we also want them to be really strategic, good relationship partners for us. So um, maybe give us an idea, and this is a tricky question because a lot of the work we do as Village Church around the world and who we partner with is, is actually really dangerous work. It's, it's, it's the hardest stuff sometimes out there. And so we can't actually tell you as much as we would like to tell you. And so in this next question I have for Caitlin about what countries we're involved in, we can't actually tell you all of the countries we're involved in because we have partnerships with people who would be put at risk for their life, organizations who would be in a lot of trouble um, because obviously anyone can watch this uh, if we got into too much detail. So understand we have to be careful about how much we share with you. But Caitlin, tell us, where are we involved in the world? What's that look like? Yeah, Jeremy said it all, but we're actually right now currently in seven different countries. And so some of those countries are um, Uganda, Ethiopia, Guatemala, um, and then some South Asian countries that we can't mention. Um, but yeah, we're having great impact. And over the course of Village Church being around, we've impacted 12 countries. And this year, we're even exploring partnerships in two to three new countries uh, to expand our sex trafficking work or the work that we're doing against sex trafficking and as well as church planting. So it's really exciting. And when those come about, we will be sharing with you. So stay tuned. And it's not just organizations, right? There are also individuals, uh, many of whom have come up through Village Church and said, okay, I want to go out and do something in the world to, uh, to help with all of these issues. And we support some of them as well, is that right? You sure do. We have 10 incredible global workers and they're serving in countries like Uganda, Germany, um, North Africa, Guatemala and Mexico. And it was actually really awesome. We met with them, seven of them in October for just a missionary gathering. And hearing the stories, it ended up being a three hour session with them because they just had so many incredible stories of what God is doing through their work. So yeah, we're so grateful to partner with them. We get so many updates and yeah, again, you can find out more about who they are on, on our website. Now saying all that, you get to hear all the stories firsthand and you get to hear all the stuff that you know is behind the scenes that we can't necessarily always talk about and update the church on but give us something give us something you know from the field some story uh give us an indication of how this is going and, and encourage us or something yeah, there's a, actually a couple of things that come to mind. The first one is we had the opportunity through one of our global partners to build, find, like, fund a, this, a school in Afghanistan. And with all the conflict that broke out in the fall, they actually had to temporarily close their school. And the kids were calling the teachers, asking them, when can I come back to school? I really want to come back to school because that school in the midst of their, the conflict zone they're living in was a place of hope and um, just a bright light in their life. And so the teachers, they, it was out of their hands to have the kids come back to school. But um, when the, it became safe to open up the school, we were actually, the, some extra costs were incurred with that. And so we were able to support them, um, continue our support with them so the school could be open. And so now kids are back in the classrooms learning and just having hope again. That's amazing. And then, oh yeah, and then I have another one. It's been incredible to see in Guatemala uh, through our partner Impact Ministries. As we know, there have been tons of school closures, extended lockdowns um, in countries around the globe. We've experienced them here in Canada and the US, but it's been extensive in other parts of the world. And what has been interesting is the staff, some of the principals were talking the other day about feeling like they're actually having more of an impact right now because what they're finding is as they're doing these Zoom calls with the kids in their homes, they're seeing the parents that are sitting right alongside with them. And that's huge because so many of these parents are illiterate. They would never plan to go to school, but just because of COVID and moving everything online, they're actually tuning in, learning alongside with their children. And so they also are meeting Jesus through that. And some of the dads have called the teacher saying, oh, can you go over this with me again? I, I didn't really understand that. So whole families are starting to be transformed through um, the schools that, are in, that we're supporting in Guatemala. So really exciting. Um, yeah, and those are just two. You've got, you know, if we didn't have a time limit, 
you could go on all afternoon, I think, telling us about stories like this from all over the world. It's, it's actually amazing. So thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. Let's thank Caitlin again, wherever, if you're at a site, if you're online, for the work she does in heading this up is, is amazing. Now, we're really excited because we're gonna focus in now on one of our biggest partners, which is International Justice Mission. And um, man, we are so honored to have our next guest with us. Um, she is an incredible woman who is actually a legend internationally when it comes to justice work. Uh, she has been involved in the freedom of scores of people around the world out of um, bonded labor, out of sex trafficking and human trafficking and all this, like an unbelievable individual. So would you uh, join me in welcoming Anu George, the CEO of IJM Canada. Anu, why don't you come on out? How are you doing this morning, Anu? Thank you, I'm doing great. A little nervous and trying to perch myself on this chair. Yeah, well, don't be nervous. You got, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll handle all the evidence. So, um, Caitlin and I are just so excited to have you here this morning. Uh, you're such a great partner that we, uh, you know, one of our key partners, really. And I know we're going to get into this in a little bit about how Village and IJM can kind of partner for the future. Uh, but we're just so excited to have you. Um, so, Caitlin and I are going to ask you a few questions about IJM and about your work. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes this morning. Absolutely. Take it away. Yeah, Anu, it's always a gift to have you with us. Thank you for being here. So first, tell everybody a little bit about your own personal story and how did you get involved with the work of IGM? It is actually a wonderful story, uh, but I think like most of you here who are interested in uh, loving Jesus and following Jesus, uh, you might have encountered justice or injustice in your life. I think for me personally, um, it was my first encounter with violence, which uh, took me to the path of understanding a little bit more about injustice. Um, I was recovering from paralysis um, because I was attacked for doing what I believed was uh, addressing injustice. Uh, it was around that time that I got to come to Canada. And uh, that is when I first heard about IJM. And I recall, um, falling on the floor, crying, because here was an organization which completely understood how violence can play a role in addressing poverty. Because everything else that I was doing at that point was completely broken off because a very powerful few men could take that away from me. Um, and after that, I think my opportunity to serve with IGM just led me down this incredible transformative path of understanding um, the solution to ending poverty, which is by tackling violence, which is by systemic um, addressing of uh, broken public justice systems. So that is my yeah, elevator pitch of telling you how I got to IGM. What keeps me here is another story, but you'll get to hear that sometime. Well, yeah, on that note, how did you come, from, come to Canada then? Because you weren't born here and you were working um, in another part of the world. So how did you get to come on to Canada? So the work that I was doing was using street theater to educate um, children who were in, in the employ of um, uh, the local mafia, which benefited from free labor, really. So I took them to the local park and I was, um, you know, training with them, teaching them fun aspects of theater. Uh, that got me in trouble. So I had this module all created to using theater. Uh, as an alternative medium to accessing education better and getting children excited about going to school. Um, so that project was recognized by the Jean Sauvé Foundation in Canada, and they had invited me to come to teach and study at Meckel University. That got me to Canada, um, and that's where I learned of IJM. So for those who don't know, why don't you just walk us through, um, in a couple of minutes here, what IJM does uh, what's the focus of the work? What's it actually look like practically? You know, what kind of makes it, what, it, what, what makes IJM great about uh, being so different and how it tackles this stuff? Yes. The, 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 the work of justice is, there are several layers to it. You know, we approach it from a simple perspective of, okay, human trafficking is a problem. There are 40.3 million slaves right now, the highest in history ever. And the way we go about addressing it by, is by rescuing, 
directly partner with the government, those who are in the public justice system, with grassroots organizations, making sure that everybody is participating in it, making it part of their movement. And then restoring. Rehabilitation is such a significant piece of this work. You can't say, okay, all of you are free now, and you go back to wherever you go back to. These are, in most cases, generational uh, you know, slaves. They have been kept in the situation because their great-grandfather took a loan of $2 at some point and was forced to repay that by working. Um, so, and then the concept of freedom is so new to them. What, what do you do? You, you've been um, to bring some kind of an example. If you've been imprisoned, say, for 40 years, you come out, you don't know what to do. So walking them through that journey of um, being restored, being rehabilitated, being integrated with, that, uh, with the society, that's a huge part of what we do. And soon after, making sure, like you uh, mentioned in your uh, message, Jeremy, the perpetrators need to be held accountable. It, it is just as Seeking justice is very core of what we do, making sure that the perpetrator is held accountable and ensuring that the others have a harder time doing what the perpetrator has been doing. And then strengthening the public justice system. In a way, like success for us is being able to work ourselves out of our job and say, work done, let's address the next big thing. And the work that we do has been addressing human trafficking in, um, protecting the widows, making sure that they are getting access to what they should be, what they are legally entitled to. It's a huge problem in Africa. Um, working on addressing online sexual exploitation of children. Um, and, and, and all of the core of what we do is primarily making sure that violence is addressed so that we are able, the, just, the poor are able to access justice in the best possible manner. Yeah, I think something that people maybe don't understand is that slavery is not like a thousand year ago issue. Even, you know, there's modern day slavery, like human trafficking and all this, but there's also actually just old school slavery oh, yes. all over the world still happening today. We just, we don't read about it. And that's some of the work that you're, you're fighting to do is, is to break that. Um, one of the things that we as Village uh, love about IJM is in how they work, uh, like this is a professional operation. The way that they have approached this is extremely ambitious, where when they do a rescue, this is not, you know, you know, who wants to take the car, right? Like this is a professional driver who's trained in professional security doing the driving. When they're talking about justice issues in the courts, these are top lawyers working uh, to change things and advocate. When they're doing rehabilitation, these are the best social workers in the country yeah. doing this work. This isn't just like people who have this on their heart and they're going to pitch in. It's a professional operation. That's what we love about IJM because the results are there uh, because they're just so dedicated and so ambitious about the work. But I just wanted to throw that in there about, uh, you know, what we love about you guys. Thank you, Jeremy. I mean, yes. Yes to all of that. I mean, I, I keep joking. It took, it took the organization a year and a half before they could hire me because they wanted to make sure. That, and, and one of the things that, called out, what, that was called out was the poor deserve the best. Mm -hmm. So we go to the very extreme to make sure that the most professional, the ones who have absolutely all the capacity to show up and do the very best are brought into the team. You're right. The drivers are taught. Uh, they are trained investigators who know where to park the car, how to flee if there is a dangerous situation. Thank you. Yeah, and Jeremy and I have both visited field offices, and so we can attest to just the clean operation that IJM has in different parts of the world. And Anna, you mentioned human trafficking. Could you explain to people what is human trafficking? I think we're often, we can envision sex trafficking, but there's so many other layers to the work of IJM. So just explain that for us. Yeah, so to put it simply, it is illegal trading of human body. Basically, um, I, I can tell you a story. Imagine, not imagine, this man exists. His name is Ron Aya. He was, uh, he, his wife was unwell, so he wanted $5 to go to the hospital. So a local money lender, who also happens to uh, be in charge of a catfish, said, okay, I will give you $5, but then you'll have to repay by working for me. And he gets into, he gets lured into this space. Fast forward 40, 50 years. 
his children, his grandchildren, are all within the confines of this catfish farm, where the job is to basically rip apart rotten carcasses of chicken, which is maggot infested, to feed the, cat, uh, to feed the catfish. He walks into this tepid cesspool of like, water that can cause, cause septic to anyone, no protection gear, nothing whatsoever, and he has to wade through this, feed the catfish, and then get out 20 hours of work every day. We went into that catfish farm, a kilometer and a half away, we could smell. We could smell that space. That is literally what led us, that was our map. Our tear glands were activated because we just couldn't take it in. So for 40 years, he and his family, the woman that he took a loan from, for, from the land, um, landlord for treatment, went into a mental disorder. I mean, she committed, attempted suicide several times because the stench took it away. The only way he could say, stay alive in that place was consuming alcohol, which is literally the only thing, the cheap arrack that they would give. No three meals a day. What shocked us the most was to see a four-year-old boy holding with such expertise and skill, I can't, a catfish. Hands that should be holding pencils and crayons and praying is skilled in doing something that even we adults can't be. And this is an example of what it looks like to be trafficked. But what we are seeing now is every day, tens of thousands of people are being sold by one trafficker from one part of the country to another part of the country for at, at the cost of maybe 10 to $20, they are sold and resold as property. And if, if you dare escape, and several of our laborers have tried escaping, one such laborer was two of them. They tried to run away from um, the hands of the trafficker. The owner hunted them down and gave them an option. Which limb do you want, the right or the left? They chopped off the right hand and the left leg of the man who tried to escape from slavery. So what this does is basically like the traditional slavery method. You can't even dare to escape because you know, you know the implications of such an act. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry. There is, like even if you're calculating like a business about 50% loss with zero investment technically, you're a millionaire. Um, so that is the landscape with which, or the reality with which uh, IGM steps into the work. What challenges, I'm curious um, to know, what are the challenges specific to the growth of you know, the internet and online media and dark web and back channels yeah. and all this kind of stuff that, that pose unique challenges right now for the kind of work that you guys are doing? Um, especially now with the pandemic uh, and the rise of technology, access to internet has kind of made it possible to expand exploitation. To give you an example, when we started our work in Philippines, we were very clear, we, we saw that there was a huge percentage of minors who were very openly available for forced prostitution. They were out there on the streets. When we started our work in less than three years, we were able to see 84% of reduction in that crime. But traffickers get very creative. Like I mentioned, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. The stakes are very high. They slowly moved on to um, the online space where there are online predators around the world who would pay a Filipino adult um, a few dollars and they basically bring children in front of the camera where young boys or young girls are forced to perform acts to each other or to themselves in front of these predators. Earlier, we could go into brothels, we could go into places where we know that people are uh, trapped and, and physically rescue them out. But with technology, I mean, all you need is the internet, all you need is a webcam and make, or even a phone camera. And it's so challenging to track this down. But IJM Philippines has partnered with government, has partnered with uh, organizations and used technology to zero in on all these IP addresses and make sure that we are tracking in and rescuing them one by one. It is just unbelievable. Just in 2021, we saw 
5 million tips of potential online sexual exploitation of children, which is triple, which is triple of last year. And, 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 and the rate at which it's growing, because the perpetrators, nothing about this crime is virtual. The perpetrators can hide behind their systems and their IP addresses um, while someone else out there is performing all of these wild acts against children. The youngest child that we have rescued was a two-month-old girl. That's the age, I mean, and at least for a minimum of two years, these children are exploited. Um, and yeah, that's the space that we get so, to So in. why don't you give up? <laughs> like, oh, that, yeah. like how, do you, how do you deal with that? How, how do you possibly, like everything I said at the very beginning here, sounds good, right? Justice will come, yes, all that kind of thing. But like, how do you? <laughs> Jeremy, remember I told you what keeps me here is another story? That is the story. Like when I came, we, our vision was very clear. Rescue thousands, protect millions, prove that justice for the poor is possible. And I had the incredible opportunity of uh, leading and training grassroots organizations to expand the work to the, you know, to the larger part of South Asia. What I saw in the next three years was just this incredible explosion of what is possible when you partner, when you do things together. Thousands and thousands were getting rescued. By 2017, we were like, you know what? We have met that mission statement. Let's move on. Let's now rescue millions, protect billions, and prove that justice for the poor is possible. It is going to happen. I have seen transformation. There is no doubt about, you know, if. There is no, you know, if this happens. When it happens is where I think pretty much every single IGMR is waiting for, and, and we are seeing it. Um, you know, all that, all that we need to know right now is who all can come and celebrate this with us. So that keeps me going. Amazing, I mean, isn't that incredible to hear that? <laughs> like, don't, aren't you, doesn't that bring you joy that we partner with, with what this is? <laughs> like, this is incredible. So, Let's maybe talk a bit about that. Yeah, our partnership with iJam, we've been partnering with them since 2016. And so if you don't know how we've partnered, we initially started a partnership with our golf tournament where we raised over $425,000 to free people from bonded slavery. And that year alone, you guys were able to rescue over 1,000 oh, people, yes. which is unbelievable. And so, so many lives who get that rehabil opportunity for rehabilitation and just freedom for the next generation as well. But then since then, we just love the work of iJam. So since 2017, we've focused on one particular office that um, does sex trafficking casework, and we've given $275,000 over the years. And just some of their stats, it, they free 200 people, um, or 200 people have been rescued. There have been 242 charges and 24 convictions. And actually, Anu, could you just talk a little bit, I mean, you hear the number of people being freed from bonded labor, but it may sound like the numbers of rescues are a bit lower for sex trafficking, but why is that? What's kind of the environment that's different? Um, one, we've done our job really well. <laughs> you know, we have, over the years, we've been able to see how much more difficult it is to find, um, you know, potential victims trafficked. So n th that is part of, you know, the success story for IGM. The other thing is the difference for sex trafficking is also just like I mentioned, the stakes are high. For a lot of people, even where I'm from, it's like, oh, sex trafficking is a crime, but labor trafficking isn't. So you'll get the attention, uh, a lot more attention for partnership with the government uh, players. And when you go into these spaces, you see how they're getting abused, like the places where they're hidden, it is, movies can only capture so much. Sometimes, or almost always, reality is far more stranger and far more, um, I don't know, nerve-wracking um, than fiction. And that is basically the space that we've been working in. But we have seen tremendous success. We are now, like after having trained over, I think, a million plus officials, uh, just in the space of how do you rescue minors who have been forced into prostitution? How do you bring them to court? How do you prepare them to give their testimony without the fear of, you know, being attacked or, in, or be able to look into the eyes of the perpetrator and not fear that they would be taken back to that space because they've been in that 
space a lot. It is so hard because these victims are terrified. They have had situations where they have been raped by people in uniform. So when IGM goes in and rescues them and takes them to a police station and says, okay, now give you a testimony, they're afraid to give their testimony because they've been raped by these people. That's how they're broken to a point where they don't know who to trust. So that makes our job really hard. And, and to prove the age, most of the times they're given hormones and injections so that they look a lot older than they should be. But they are a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old girl who is supposed to be passed off as an 18-year-old girl. So getting all of those things sorted makes our job hard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to finish by asking you specifically one more question, and that is, what is your dream mm -hmm. for Village Church and IJM? I'm kind of seeing that happen right now. Jeremy, like, Jesus is justice. Jesus deeply cares about this work. And like you called out when you were Proverbs 21, you were just, it doesn't, it's not like, okay, let's do this and leave it at that. It's going the full circle. I see Village Church completely gets it. Like even your willingness to say, you know what? We will not talk about that because it might make the church look good, but it can come in the way of you freeing more people. That humility to step into that dark place and say, we understand. And by 2030, we are doing it, Jeremy. We are rescuing millions. We are protecting that billion population from slavery. There is gonna be, we are gonna mortally wound the giant of slavery. But to do this with the church, to do this with somebody who is an actual ambassador of what Jesus wants to do, makes it such a fun journey. It doesn't feel lonely. And I, I've said this, and I might have shared this with you. When I was in the field, there was a dangerous situation where my entire team and I were trapped. There was no way we could get out. There was no guarantee that we could go home. And I remember texting my colleagues saying, I think this is it. She was like, don't lose hope. I'm activating the prayer partners. Less than, in less than five minutes, I'm getting a call from the prime minister's office saying, hey, this is regarding the appointment that you wanted. I was like, we are in trouble. We are trapped. No official is going to be helping us out of here. We could just disappear. Could you please help? That, that is the prayer that this work depends on and Village Church gets it. The partnership that we share is exactly what God wants us to be doing right now. So that is my vision, hope, and joy when it comes to partnering with the Village Church. Amazing, it's an honor for us to do that. So we're gonna tell you just kind of how you can do that more personally, um, but, but bigger picture, just so you understand, we wanna lead the Canadian church in this. Yes. We wanna be an example for the rest of the Canadian church of what it means to be the church, to fight this stuff. Um, and so your partnership with us in that, as the people of the church is really important, um, to grow that, because what better witness would there be than the Canadian church being known for bringing justice all around the world? I mean, what an incredible thing that would be. And the opportunity is there. We've talked about, we don't have time to get into it. We've talked about how Canada is perfectly positioned to oh, be the country yes. to do that. Can I say that? Please, once again, Jeremy? Sure, you've come all this way. <laughs> okay. No, truly, when, when I had no intention of leaving the field, because that's what I thought God had called me to do. I had no intention to leave where I'm from. But when my team had to take that difficult decision of choosing one rescue or the other for want of resources, the perfect country for me to come and work out of was Canada. Because the time that I was here a decade ago, what I saw was debates in rooms in, in, in 
classrooms and universities were becoming laws in less than three years. This is a country where 93% of the population cares about where their food comes from, where no other country in the world cares as much as Canadians do. And what better place than this for me to be able to come and talk about the work of justice? And what better movement that can be led than like a church like Village, which wants to lead Canadians and Canadian churches into the space of justice. Sorry, now I'll let you speak. Hey, so, so let's, not, let's not catch up to that. Let's lead that as the church in Canada. Let's, let's be the ones that actually are out front and then the rest of Canada follows us. How about that? I mean, that would be amazing in this work, right? Yes, amen. So there's that big picture sense, but then there's the very personal sense. This is where I'm just, I'll leave you with. Um, there's an opportunity to personally partner with IJM by becoming what they call a freedom partner. And this is very simple. You, you basically go online to ijm.ca slash village church, and it's all there to explain it for you and how you do this. And you can, you can sign up to make, say, like a, a $50 monthly kind of commitment or something. And then what you get is you actually get partnership with the work. You get the reports and the stories and all this kind of stuff. You get to you know, to know what you're praying for. You get to actually be the people that Anu's talking about in the story. Um, I want to give you that opportunity. I think it would be amazing if we blessed IJM. You know, whoever, wherever you are listening to this, hearing this, if you're at a physical site, you can go into your lobbies and there'll be tables and desks and things for you to be able to talk to people and find out more about this or your connect desks um, online. There'll be slides on screens, however it is that you're hearing this. Let's do something incredible and really bless this partner of ours with a ton of freedom partners through this. Um, so that this amazing and incredible work, um, that this amazing and incredible person is helping to lead all around the world, um, can go on and do even bigger and more amazing things than we've even heard about today. Wouldn't that be amazing and, and incredible for us to be at the front of that kind of partnership and change? Uh, man, I can just... It gets me excited thinking about this kind of partnership with you, yeah. So why don't I pray for the work? Um, thank you, both of you, for being here. Let's give them uh, our appreciation here, Caitlin and Anu, for being here. Um, you guys can go, and I'm going to pray uh, for the work. Why don't you join me in praying uh, for, for this really hard and incredible work? God, would you bless everybody involved in bringing your kingdom of justice uh, to fruition all around the world? God, we give you the workers out in the field right now that are facing trouble, difficulty, fear, roadblocks. God, would you just intercede? Would you be the power that they need to see this work completed? God, we trust you to do it. Now move us to partner, not just with them, but to partner with you in the work going forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.